actual prison there. Somebody sent me actually. Before we get started, I know please feel free to continue to eat and go in and out and get food as you need to, but um, I know also that some people like to run and so we need to make sure that we get food as we need to. Dinner and also Sarah Rogers from FHI for recommending it. So, so I said, <laughs> um, and also thank you to Michael Cornett for helping supervise this event. Um, and Michael, thank you for suggesting our speaker today, uh, Tim Furniture, who is coming to us from Guilford College, not too far down the road. And as I found out when Tim was here and we were having lunch together, everybody already knows him. He has lots of friends who he's worked with in, in medieval and Renaissance studies. And he, really well connected at Duke, so it seems like a natural, almost like a, a return homecoming for him to be here. He's a professor of history at Guilford College, but he has in many ways also stood in these shoes, which is that he has been the chair of the humanities division twice at Guilford College, and, and really thinks very deeply about the humanities in general, which is why uh, he's a great interlocutor for us uh, to come together and, and discuss things, and I hope this will be a, a good provocation for discussion. Um, he is a, a, a very prolific scholar working on Renaissance Italy, uh, has several books and uh, co-edited volumes, and he has a current project in particular, and he really works on the kind of wellspring of humanism, so it makes sense that you're really interested in, in what the humanities mean coming out of this long, deep history of humanistic inquiry. But his current project is Before Enlightenment, Play and Illusion in Renaissance Humanism. And uh, he's um, looking at the humanist contribution to philosophical inquiry. Uh, one of the things that also uh, really piqued my curiosity uh, about Tim's work is that he is also the, um, the uh, host, writer, and impresario of a really interesting website called Humanities Watch. And uh, it's about finding the humanities voice. And what's so interesting about it, and I just want to read you one little paragraph from it because I think it really speaks to the ways in which he's approaching the humanities and thinking about it for 21st century types of uh, interests. Who watches the watchmen? Who, who guards the guardians? If the humanities are the curators of culture and communication, do they stand watch over leading societal forces, for example, those of business, science, healthcare, and technology? And do these forces have a role in fostering the humanities? How do the humanities express themselves? This site promotes, this is the, the Humanities Watch site, promotes these questions, creating a conversation among diverse fields of culture and society in order to understand their shared responsibilities. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Tim Kershaw. Thank you. Thank you. This is this is on. Everybody can hear. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I want to uh, thank you very much for coming and thank you for this opportunity. I'd also, of course, like to express my gratitude to Meisenfeld and for the kind invitation, and also to Michael Burnett uh, for setting the event in motion. So the title of my talk, as you can see, is the question of the humanities. The core of my remarks attends to imagery and its interpretation. The humanities, uh, I would say, preoccupy themselves with language and imagery, and in fact, are their guardians, watching over their use and holding the other deaths. The question of the humanities may appear, however, ambiguous and even careless. Is this a question about the humanities, in which we ask about the purpose? or function at the present time. And grammatically speaking, the title would therefore pose an objective genitive construction. Or alternately, is this a question, we might understand this as in the subjective sense, that it is a question by the humanities, one that the humanities themselves pose. With this in mind, let me present the theme for my remarks in our discussion. My remarks will be about 30 minutes, and then we'll have time for the workshop and, and conversation afterwards. The challenge and opportunity for the humanities lie in moving away from A, the question about the humanities, and beginning instead with B, the, the humanities' own questioning, and then, after this effort and enterprise, moving back to A. We focus first on the question the humanities themselves may ask with regard to the present time, our contemporary culture, 
And then, dialectically, we may also see more clearly how others, outside the humanities per se, may help us understand ourselves and make our voice more resonant. This is the idea behind my website, which you may see, and Jennifer's already alluded to it, has a question for its mission statement. Can culture help, help us live well? And also for its motto, which is taken from Juvenile's Six Satire, Quis Custodiates Os Custodiates, Who Watches the Watchmen? I began this site two years ago on discovering the need for greater self-reflection, not only within myself, but also within our chosen fields. Now, you could call it a professional midlife crisis, but it doesn't exist. A variation on the Jungian Nekia, or Night Sea Journey. The goal, the telos of my experience, was to uncover the reasons for the things we do. They're arcane, my mind. Understood as origin, cause, or really the principle. I use the Greek terms, Nekia, telos, arcane, because they spoke to me. And they provided me with a language of introspection that has continued to open up new outlooks on our humanity's horizons. But journeys are never solo affairs, and that's the final one. And I was helped on this mission by a friend who's running professionally outside the humanities, introduced me to other terms, less Greek, but perhaps equally foreign to us, context, strategic, futuristic. These are terms from a Gallup skills test, which I took. <laughs> designed to help people understand their professional aptitudes. Now, where do you imagine most of us fall within these categories? And if you this context, this is the Gallup adjective, by the way, context is an adjective, you would be right. So we do not tend to think strategically or futuristically, but we're rather inclined by nature and profession to examine texts, gather stories, and hearken the voices from the past. Uh, those um, whom Umberto Eco called our elders, in order to interpret what lies before us. We study expression, lean its polysemous range, and strive to understand the conditions that allow this language to be spoken or silenced. This inclination toward contextual understanding, we all agree, is to be highly prized. And again, to cite Eco, quote, this is Eco, our wealth compared to illiterates, or to those that, though literate, do not read, is that they live and will live only their lives while we have lived many lives. And yet, perhaps you know where I'm heading with this, we live in a time that prizes strategic and futuristic thinkers. They're the headliners. Elon Musk, Sheryl Sandberg, Jeff Bezos, to name just three from the science, technology, and business fields. Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan, a pediatrician, could establish, did establish, a multi-billion dollar initiative to eradicate all major diseases within the children's lifetimes through science and technology, of course. TED Talks, the acronym originally means technology, entertainment, and design, today claim to, this is a quote, cover almost all topics from science to business to global issues. Something may be missing. <laughs> With these strategic and visionary views so prominent, where can the contextual voice sound forth? We sometimes, perhaps often, find ourselves like introverts at a dinner party. But just as we, in our role as teachers, must create for our introverted students space to speak, to use Chaucer's phrase, so too must we present ourselves as welcome guests and need equal participants in the current cultural conversation. As to how we may realize this entrance, what strategy or vision we may choose to guide us, we may think on the question of the humanities, the question we are asking, with all our contextual resources at hand. And since these resources are rooted in language, I turn to the thought of William James. Here it is. To say that all human thinking is essentially of two kinds, reasoning on the one hand, and narrative, descriptive, contemplative thinking on the other, is to say what every reader's experience will corroborate. James recorded this thought in an essay that studies the intelligence of dogs. <laughs> and he's a lover for him. And he was led to consider the varieties of human thought processes in a way that is helpful to us when distinguishing between the thinking cultivated alternatively by the sciences and by the humanities. And it fell to one of his great readers, Jerome Bruner, to elucidate this distinction. It's a long quote, but I think worth listening to. Science attempts to make a world that remains invariant across human intentions and human plights. The density of the atmosphere does not, must not alter as a function of one's ennui with the 
the world. On the other hand, the humanist deals principally with the world as it changes with the position and stance of the viewer. For in effect, the humanities have as their implicit agenda the cultivation of hypotheses, the art of hypothesis generating. It is in hypothesis generating rather than in hypothesis falsification, which he sees as the, the domain of the sciences. Then one cultivates multiple perspectives and possible worlds to match the requirements of these perspectives. To the degree that modern science also is involved in hypothesis generating as well as in hypothesis testing, it is akin to the activities of the humanist and artist. This much we know from examining the metaphor of crutches with which the good intuitive scientist proceeds up his abstract mountain. But his object is always to convert those dense metaphors into transparent, fragile hypotheses of science untestable axioms that will generate hypotheses that well, may be tested. Right, that's Bruner. Bruner, a psychologist like James, would value the humanities for their ability to cultivate multiple perspectives in possible worlds, to display and develop the narrative, descriptive, contemplative thinking that James identifies. Matter of fact, Bruner uses the quote from James as the epigram for this book. But how does this characteristic help us in the humanities to formulate questions that engage the strategic and visionary realm of science, business, and technology? Let's lean on and test the metaphoric crutches that are shared by the sciences and humanities alike and turn to the central image of my presentation, the mountain. A mountain can own many things, struggle and achievement. Here is Pinterecchio, a 16th century design of Hesiod's Hill of Virtue. Uh, they can connote beauty, strength, and stability, the world axis, another form of the cosmic tree. And not least, we're familiar with uh, the mountain as the entrance to heaven or the abode of the gods. Mount Sinai, Purgatory Mountain, uh, Mount Olympus. I would have us view a more basic aspect shadow and light, obscurity, and illumination. These ultimate sides or faces illustrate the humanity's place, potential, and challenge. Let us imagine, looking at the mountain, that the humanities find themselves in the shadows, on the shady side of the hill. And what's the meaning of this shadow to Nebus area? There are at least three meanings I'll suggest now. Obscurity, uselessness, and mindfulness. Now, the obscurity may be obvious to some of us. We are in the shade. We're obscured and overlooked, while the sciences, business, and technology are in the sun. The question I would ask with this image is whether this is a false or even lamentable position. Or is it not rather a place true to the present nature of the humanities themselves, indeed one in which they can discover their resources and energy? I would like us to think through this image about the humanities' alterity and apparent uselessness in a cultural landscape in which the sciences and economic affairs appear so useful, so brightly prominent. There's a philosophical tradition that has meditated on the value of uselessness from the Taoist Wangsa of the fourth century BCE to Martin Heidegger. A saying of Wangsa helps us enter into the question of the humanities along the lines proposed at the outset and elaborated by James and Brewer, illustrated by the mouth. And here is the anecdote. It said, we shouldn't, it's Wangsa. These sayings of yours are useless. And Wangsa replies, it is only with people who know about the useless that there is any point in talking about uses. In all the immensity of heaven and earth, the man uses no more than his room for his feet. If recognizing this, we were to dig away the ground around his feet all the way down to the other world, would it still be useful to the man? We should say, it would be useless. Then it is plain that the useless does serve a use. To know the useless is to know what is useful. People suddenly gain a new perspective on what is useful or useless as the ground shifts under their feet. They may appreciate the new perspective, a sense of the larger whole, when they recognize the limited vision and the contingency of their knowledge of things. Heidegger, reading Zhuangzi for maybe 30 years, Martin Luber had translated Zhuangzi in 1910, we think Heidegger had access to that. He came to emphasize the important, Heidegger came to emphasize the importance of the useless. He cites the episode we just heard at the end of the dialogue he wrote in the mid-40s between an older and younger man in a Russian prison camp. He cites this very end. And in the short essay, Traditional and Technological uh, Language, he writes, 
It is wrong to apply the standard of usefulness to the useless. That's Mitzvah. The useless has its own greatness and determining power since it does not let anything be made out of it. In this manner, useless is the sense of things. The passion for the useless, he writes elsewhere, quote, fosters the insight that a thought is only a genuine thought when it requires no use or application and is incomparable to utility. Heidegger relates the useless to mindfulness or meditation. This word is zinom, translated in various ways. Mindfulness cultivated in the shadows can, he says, awaken the sense for the useless. Philosophy itself is useless since it inquires into the sense of poor truth being of the arena in which things become apparent and knowledge may be realized. In his notebook's contributions to philosophy, the second quote here, he writes that philosophy is the knowledge that comes from mindfulness. It is directly useless, but at the same time, supreme. <clears throat> Thus, uselessness is part of mindfulness, has a bearing on it, as we are mindful of or meditate on the larger picture. Where does that leave us on the mountain, except in the shade? Science, technology, healthcare, business. These fields are, at the present time, in sun. They are society's energy centers. They bask in its attention. They promise the means to material success social betterment, even world peace. And yet, we see that the thinking of Zwangza and Heidegger reveals a critical feature of the humanities. The thinking is essentially dialectic. It employs dialogue, like the humanities as a whole, to convey its sense of things, and is deeply concerned with conversation and the modalities of language. It is only with people who know about the useless, Zwangza says to his friend, that there is any point in talking about uses. The useless is seen in relation to, in conversation with, the useful. To return to our image, the shade in which we find ourselves becomes more distinct, more present, in contrast to the sunny side of the hill. The humanities, from their apparent uselessness and cultivation of mindfulness, are positioned to see and ask questions about the whole. Light and shadow, prominence and obscurity, utility and uselessness, we appear to have progressed only a little beyond the obvious when thinking on the humanities. But we have stepped forward in mining the meaning of the mountain. The metaphor still has insights to yield that will clarify our steps so far. We can say the following. The shade does not exist without the light, no more than the light without the shade. Now you know this symbol, right? This, the left white side is the side of yang, of rising energy. And the right dark side is the side of yin, of sinking energy. The Chinese character for yang it's a pictogram. It displays, literally displays, a sunny side of a hill. That's the pictorial meaning of the Chinese yang. And it connotes growth, action, and outward force. The character for yin is the hillside in shade. One quality of yin is passivity, but more profoundly it represents patience, inwardness, and regeneration. Yin and yang are therefore two sides of the mountain. They are fundamentally dialectical and dialogue with one another. Situated at the heart of Zhuangzi's teaching, they connote central truths for the humanities in our question. Let us think on three. Reciprocity, balance, and complementarity. Shade and sun, yin and yang, and for our purposes, the humanities and the sciences stand in reciprocal relation to one another. Yang, at its most full, still contains the seed of yin. And yin at zenith, still preserves the seed of God. The two stand in need of one another. By analogy, the sciences require the humanities' meditative, mindful attendance on language in order to be fully understood. And the humanities, too, are shaped by the energy of Yang. They are wedded to science, respond to, and are molded by it as shaped by the sun. The simplest example of this are the technologies of communication. <laughs> which we often unreflexively use without dwelling on the ways it conditions our exchanges and our knowledge. And we have learned much about our historical world through the undersea, for example, through undersea explorations by those of Robert Ballard, for example, or by DNA testing on pre-Columbian Native Americans or 14th century London plate -making. And indeed by the entire science of paleopathography, which is the study of ancient diseases through biological and textual evidence. But it and therefore, the two mountainsides show us the principle of balance. Yin cannot exist without yang, or yang without yin. 
And they may seem to us and many other people that all is young, that science, business, and technology dominate our cultural landscape. But this strength our metaphor suggests, we stay within the metaphor, is that it's illusory. It is not so much that young is strong, but that yin is weak. The balance is lost, and the humanities, which reside and trace out our deeper, inward, mindful selves, have lost their self-possession. This loss is not the science's gain. For cultural historians and historians of science remind us how time and place have conditioned our knowledge of the natural world. Indeed, our understanding of what nature is, as we are, Jesus. The balance is a dynamic one. There are times and regions when the humanities have been in the sun, in cultural prominence, and the sciences have been yin, in shadow. Petrarch, one of the great progenitors of the humanities, was famous in his lifetime, courted by the powerful. And we can also recall other historical figures such as Hildegard von Bingen, or Ibn Sina, or Leon Batiste Alberti, Francis Bacon, Goethe, Erwin Chargoff, just a few, in whom science and humanities have been in harmony, on equal display. If at the present time the humanities cultivate inwardness and a heightened awareness of our inward selves, they do so to provide the proper equilibrium for the more renowned scientific pursuits. And this brings us to the presence of complementarity. Without the shadow side, the mountain is not whole, not a mountain. The sunless side is not a side. Yang is not yang. Sciences are not fully the sciences. This is not genuinely business. What is useful is only known as useful when one knows the useless. When one does not psychologically, culturally, or academically consign the useless, the shadow of humanities to unconsciousness. Without history, philosophy, and poetry, to mention only three fields, the sciences lose their way, lose definition of wealth. Rainer Maria Rilke, a poet of the inner life, used similar imagery to convey the sense of wholeness. This is from a letter of Rilke. Like the moon, so too does life surely have a side continually turned away from us, a side not the opposite to life, but rather its completion toward fulfillment, toward full counting, toward the real, entire, complete sphere of being. The humanities that follow Rilke allow us to explore the dark side of the moon, our celestial mountain. At home in the shadows, they let us see the moonscape or mountain as a whole. They bring us to ask, finally, about the contours of life, the human life, the sciences, and the business world, without which, fair to mind, humanities would be incomplete. So in thinking about the questions that humanities may ask, we enter through this mountain image into the region of obscurity, uselessness, and mindfulness. By meditating on our apparent uselessness, we can see the larger whole of the humanities and the sciences in their dialectical relationship, reciprocity, balance, complementarity. The humanities therefore shape the sciences. In fact, the humanities core, as guardians of language, provide hidden energy, see the yang, so to speak, to express the deeper side of the sciences and the greater meaning of business. By so doing, the humanities are not diminished, but rather enhanced, as many scientists and business people will tell us. With this in mind, we now turn back to the question about the humanities, that A question, to the ways the sunlit fields of business and science have shaped and elicit the humanities voice. We'll look at a few examples before engaging in conversation in the workshop. To begin with the world of business and industry, let's examine three catchphrases that have achieved currency among corporate leaders, think tanks, and entrepreneurs. Soft skills, creative economy, and mindfulness training. Most recently written up in the Harvard Business Journal. I imagine you have heard these phrases and perhaps in the habit of contextual thinkers, examine them in passing, and set them aside in the awareness of their own passing and shallowness. For when, expressed, for when expressed by business leaders, do they truly capture the essential qualities of the humanities of what we do? Or do they not rather attempt to instrumentalize our work, make it useful, when we have been speaking up to now about the humanities' more profound uselessness? If we say no to the first question, and yes to the second, may we not also ask a third question? So what? <laughs> We're just like a favorite phrase of Renaissance humanists from uh, Plautus, I think. But also Virgil, quid tongue, what then? 
As guardians of language, can we not accept these phrases and in conversation with business, show forth their deeper dimensions? Soft skills are ultimately about dialogue. Sharing ideas and working toward the greater mission. The creative economy is one that requires imagining the whole person and our need for symbols, images, and art. And mindfulness is more than a 10 minute practice or living in the moment. But as one quality of successful business people is discipline, why not engage them in a disciplined pursuit of greater mindfulness in the form of humanities exercises? Many of them already understand the importance of the humanities. We need only speak with them. Each of these three terms or phrases, soft skills, creative economy, mindfulness, reach out to the humanities <coughs> as the seed of yin, so to speak, within the yang of business. And what are the sciences? What might they ask about the humanities and reveal to us as hidden resources that we in our contextual studies might easily overlook. Here are two, just two, from the realm of virology and neuroscience. I think you'll find them interesting. <clears throat> in a recent study, Microsoft funded the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim to test the way students' brains responded to writing notes by hand in comparison to typing notes with a keyboard. The results showed that writing or drawing by hand activated more parts of the brain for a longer period of time in a way supportive of learning. The study concluded that, and I quote the result, the physical movement of the pen makes the difference. It results in different neural activity that governs all levels of cognitive processing and learning. Microsoft was evaluating the, surf the virtues of its surface tablet. But what is the potential for the humanity? What if we were to use this method to explore on a neurological and empirical level the way our minds respond when taking notes to the poems of Whitman, to the ideas of Hannah Arendt, to the history of Libby? Does this response vary according to pen and keyboard? What might sciences disclose about the secret depths of our studies in a way now accessible and demonstrable to a culture conditioned by STEM? More basically, how might we sponsor more studies in this vein that demonstrate the manner in which the digital world affects the way our minds work, so that we, may, we might appreciate more fully the cultural and historical challenges and promise of our present time. My second and last example. Another study this time at Princeton, Uri Hassan, who was an undergraduate philosophy major. Uri Hassan has shown through MRI imaging how people process information not in isolation, but in conversation. His work demonstrates the way the words of a speaker may actually shape a listener's response, and even more intriguingly, how a listener can be said to anticipate what a speaker might say. Thus, the harmony of brain patterns can indicate the presence of actual communication. Now, wouldn't it be interesting to try this imaging during class lectures? <laughs> For the humanities, in the arts, but how might we map out the brain patterns of actors when they recite the exchanges between Hamlet and Ophelia, or those between Lear and Cordelia? What might we discover when students rehearse the dialogues of Plato, in contrast to contemporary conversation? These are only two examples from science that command our attention. There are many others we can find. Given its resources, due disposition to pursue these inquiries. In conclusion, I'd like us to consider the following paradox. It's a conditional paradox, but it's a paradox. The future of the humanities may lie in the sciences and business. Consider that. And their future may lie with us. The choice is ours. And then with that paradox in mind, we're now carried forward. So thank you very much, and we'll on to the workshop. So, appreciate it.